steak dinner. Yeah, I almost slobbered on myself. <laughs> Amen. If you would like to go, it starts at 6 p.m. And if you would like to go, uh, please uh, sign your name on the paper that's at the welcome desk. I'll be picking it up this evening after the evening service and calling and uh, telling them how many steaks they need to, or if they can't get them all, how many pieces they need to cut that one into. Um, <laughs> Because I'm going to tell them how many folks we got coming. So it, this is our men's fellowship night. So if you uh, want to go with us. Uh, this coming Friday night is a youth group lock-in. Uh, it's going to start at 5 p.m. and go to 10 the next morning, Saturday morning. And so uh, all of our youth, that's all of our youth are invited to come. Brother T.J. wanted me to make sure that uh, you understand every youth. You're welcome to come and be a part of it. You got any questions about that, you can see Brother TJ, Brother Charlie, Miss Holly, Miss Laurie, any one of those folks can answer those questions, I'm sure, for you. Uh, come see me and I'll point you to them because I may not know your answer. A um, couple more things, then I'm going to get to the message. In the um, announcements that you may have seen flashing behind us during the song service, I want to push as best I can revival services coming up September, which is just two weeks away. September, to September is here. Next Sunday, September 1st. This week, I'm this, this month, this year, I'm an old man. I used to be young just yesterday. Anyway, revival, Brother Shannon Shelby will be bringing the messages. Now, you, you got to hear this young man. I believe he's anointed by God. A brother Shannon Shelby will be Shelby would be bringing the messages and um, on 5th, 6th, and 7th at 7 o'clock. And then um, on that Saturday night, uh, the 7th, um, we'll have a special reception afterwards in the fellowship hall, just like we do with our gospel sings. And Eternal Vision is going to be doing our special singing during that week. So I want you here and let everybody know you possibly can. The following Friday is our gospel sing night. That's the Southern Joy. Brother Junior Combs and his family, they're probably one of the most technically on spot on groups that, that we have. These guys, uh, if you don't have their CD, uh, you are missing something with, uh, with the Southern Joy. They are extraordinarily good. And they'll be here with us uh, on the 13th, Friday the 13th. They'll be here. And then, um, then we got our fall festival coming up. So you'll see all that stuff in the bulletin. Make sure that you um, know all about that. I want to ask you this morning if you'll turn over to the book of Philippians. The book of Philippians. I think I remembered to say everything I needed to say. I hope I did. God bless you. We got some folks that are up in the hospital. I want you to be praying for all of them. If you're on the prayer chain, you know about that. If you're not on the prayer chain, you need to get on the prayer chain. Brother Keith. Brother Keith is sitting right there uh, toward the back, and Brother Keith uh, manages our call them all um, uh, calling list for us, and it's pretty extensive and a lot of work, and he does a great job at keeping that. If you ever have any issues, if you say, Pastor, I'm not getting the calls or whatever, I always refer to Brother Keith and say, so-and-so says they're not getting calls or, or something of that nature, but if you like to get on there and know how you can pray for things that are going on, folks in the hospital, needs, that type of stuff. Um, see, Brother Keith, if you'd like to get a call whenever the bread gets dropped off and the pancakes, or not the pancakes, the cupcakes, that type of stuff, get with Brother Keith. He can hook you up with that. There's so many lists that you can be on. You can be in the men's fellowship list, ladies' fellowship list. You can be um, uh, in your Sunday school list if you want that type of thing so just make sure you see him and ask questions and he'll give you the answers and uh, I just want to encourage you to do that it's one of the best tools I believe that God's ever given us so y'all keep continue to use that in the book of Philippians chapter number one I titled this for my life and what I was thinking about when when God gave me these verses in my mind I uh, and for those of you that may not know I've told some of these preachers in the church I've I said, the way that I get sermons is sometimes an idea comes to me and then I'll go look for the verse that matches the idea in my mind and then I'll try to build around that. Sometimes I'm reading the verse and the idea just kind of jumps on you like this right here and won't let you go. And that's how the sermon comes. Uh, then, then there's a couple other times that it just, uh, something just falls on you like a house out of the sky. But 
this particular one, God gave me just the idea. I was thinking the other day about how wonderful it is um, that God has blessed us in our life. Thank you, Brother Dave. And I wanted, and I thought to myself, I said, well, what is this life all about? What do I want my life to mean after everything is said and done? You ever think about that? You live your life. I'm getting to be an older man. I'm not old yet, but I'm getting <laughs> older. I feel pretty old. I'll be 60 in October. I'm a young and compared to you. But listen, listen, seriously, I begin to think about it. I'm definitely in the, the, the waning years of my life. I understand that. And when I think about the latter years and I look at my life, I, I begin to wonder, what about my life? What would I want someone to say about me when I'm dead and gone? I believe when it struck me was I was watching a biography or something on one of those channels about the life of Elvis Presley. And after it was all said and done, it seemed he died a sad man. And I said to my wife, I said, do you think that he would come back to do it again? And she said, that's what she said. She said, no, I don't think he would. He seemed to be tormented over the fame and the fortune. He loved what he did, but the stuff that he loved, became uh, he became slave to it. It, it. it began to overtake his life. And, and at the end of it, what, his, what he enjoyed and what he thought was uh, him living his life began to be his life living him. And so I began to think, uh, what about you, buddy? What about your life? What do you want folks to be able, would you, would you want somebody to look and say, hey, if he could come back, would he live it again the way he lived it the first time? And I'm, I'm just saying to you, it really began to stick in my heart, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Uh, for the offering, wow, for the offering this morning, $667. Thank you, guys. Man, that is wonderful. That is great. No, sir, I wouldn't touch one penny of it. That money's all going toward the building. I promise you. Oh, by the way, I'm very particular about that type of stuff. For those of you that don't know, I know I'm killing the time for you. Now, I'll preach quick. <laughs> for those of you that don't understand what we do, when you drop your money into that cross-shaped piece of furniture right there, which was, by the way, uh, Brother uh, Jimmy Fulford had that built for us. I'll never forget when God laid it on my heart to quit passing the plate. It was just a couple years after I started pastoring. And I told Brother Jimmy about it, and he liked to turn the backflip. He said, I think that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. And I said, well, thank you. And then he said, can I build it? And I said, Jimmy, you can't build nothing. <laughs> he went home. I had described to him what I wanted. He went home. What he was good at was a computer. He went home and got on the computer and he come back and he showed me a picture. He said, is this what you're talking about? And I said, that's exactly what I'm talking about. He said, let me build it. I said, okay. He had it ready in a week. He went and paid somebody to put that thing together. We're still the same one. We need to do a few repairs on it, by the way, guys. It's been knocked over a time or two. But he, he had that thing built and he brought it back. And I was still struggling with taking up an offering that way because I thought, in fact, I told God, I said, if you don't put a, a basket or a plate under their nose, they won't give. So if we don't, put, if we don't take up an offering, our offerings are going to go down. And God kept telling me, just do what I told you to do. And so I, I mentioned it to Jimmy. He had that thing built. And I thought, well, you know, give me a month. I got to work this thing. Out. The next Sunday, he didn't set that thing up and was telling people about it. And, they, and people was getting excited and dropping their money in there. And I'm telling you, the offerings went up, not down. Not down. Amen. And, I, and I, I had to tell the Lord, I'm sorry I doubted you. He knows what he's talking about. So anyway, I want to just explain to you. So that's where your tithes and your offerings go right there. And that's a personal thing between you and God. If you've been cheating God, it don't matter if I don't know it or the, right. uh, the treasurer don't know it or the deacons don't know it. God knows it. Amen. And what's, what's, what's just as important is you know it. And, and you, you feel the conviction of it right now, and I know you're squirming a little bit. You can fix that. In the same turn, if you give him more than what you should, it don't matter if the pastor knows it. Or yeah, you, you can't impress him. So you, you can't impress him, and, you, and you, you certainly won't disappoint him. But I'm telling you, God knows all about it. And you need to do what God told you. So anyway, 
when you put that money in there, I, this is what I wanted. To, I brought this whole thing up for. I want you to understand that we have a deacon and a treasurer. They they count these things in pairs. They it's accountability. They write it down because uh, something was said about buying a cup of coffee out of it. There's not one cent that goes anywhere except for where it's designated. And I want you to understand that. It's important. We have accountability, don't we, Mark? You're one of those guys. David, you're one of those guys. There's deacons all around this room that are one of those guys that go through that door, go into the other room. They count it. They double count it. They, have, they write it down. It's reported. There's other eyes that see the report so that it's all got to match up when it's all said and done. I just want you to understand that. Uh, and um, it, it don't go in, in no individual's pocket. Amen. If that ever does happen, we're going to be unhappy about that right. from here down. Okay, so I just want you to understand. Amen. And I believe with all of my heart that God is pleased with that. God's pleased with your doing. Just let me talk to you this morning. God wants you to do what you're responsible to do. God wants you to be, you, you got a responsibility. I done told you that he loves you so much that he sent his only begotten son. He did his part. But don't you know that you won't be born again if you don't do your part? Is that right? And God loves his children that have been born again. He loves those saved individuals. Man, it just thrills. All of heaven rejoices when a saint, when a, when a sinner becomes a saint. Yeah. All of heaven. And, I, and that's, that's wonderful things. But let me tell you something. The blessings that could flow in your life are God's got them ready for you and he's trying his best to deliver them to you if you would just be obedient unto him. Because you got a part to do. You still got a part to do. It's, it's about that. And so, the, so now I get to preach. In, in Philippians chapter number one, you can get it back up there, guys. Here we go. Philippians chapter one, what I want for my life after all, after everything is done. Philippians 1, 21, this is the apostle Paul doing the writing. And he's talking about the idea of he was ready to go home. He had done seen, he had done seen heaven. God had done brought him up there and showed him some stuff. And son, he was... He was getting a little rabbit in his feet. He was ready to go home. He had done seen some of the glories that was waiting on the other side. You know how it is. And he was, he was excited. So death had absolutely no fear for him at all. Death to him was a friend that would transport him from here to there. Amen. So he was excited and waiting on him. This is what he says. For me, he says in verse 21, for me to live is Christ. If I'm going to continue in this life, Christ is going to be glorified. I'm going to give him everything I got. If I'm living, then he'll never die. You've heard folks say that about the kids, right? As long as little Susie's alive, then her mama will never be dead. You know that? Because she's just a spitting in. And that's what he was saying. I'm going to be so much like Christ that as long as I'm alive, he's alive. He said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Mm, so if I stay here, Christ is going to be exalted. If I'm taken home, I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to be blessed beyond measure. He says in verse 22, but, but if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. The fruit of my labor is the idea that he was going to um, be a blessing, an example to others, and to encourage them and to bless them. I'll show you that in just a minute. Yet what I, yet what I shall choose, I wot not. He said, I, I'm, I'm not clear which one that I want to pick. It's going or staying. Yeah, amen. He said, I am in, in, in verse number 23, for I am a straight, I'm in a, a tight place yeah, between two. Having a desire to depart... And to be with Christ, which is far better. I want you to notice that verse, number 23. Notice it says that when, when, we, when, when a believer dies, their soul departs their body. So there ain't none of that soul sleeping stuff that somebody might have tried to teach you about. The Bible says to be absent from the body is to be. So it says here that he has having a desire to depart for his spirit to depart from his body. And he says if that happened, notice where it goes. To be with Christ. Amen. So he says, I, I have a desire. The, my, my number one choice is to go home to be with the Lord. I believe whenever we get to that place 
that I, our the greatest desire is that we might see our Savior face to face. We were singing those songs like, what a day that'll be. Whoo, son. And it begins to well up inside of me where I can't hardly sing. My tears falling down, my, my throat's lumped up, and I keep thinking, Lord, soon, soon, come quickly, Lord Jesus. What a day that's going to be when we see the one who has the nail-scarred hands, who has the pierced side, who gave his life for us. What a day. Your life is not in vain if it's lived for Jesus. One of these days we get to see him. And Paul says, I'm in, I'm in a tight place because I'm trying to choose between two. How, I, my desire is to go to be with the Lord, verse 24. Nevertheless, nevertheless, to abide in the flesh, to stay here, is more needful for you guys. It's more needful for you. God done told him. God spoke to him. God, Paul had been praying about going home. He desired to go home. He wanted to see Jesus face to face. And the Lord told him, said, son, you got to stay a little longer. And so he said, I, I, nevertheless, he said, I, I've been, I know I've got to stay in the flesh and it's more needful for you that I stay. Why? Because I want to be an example to you and I want to be a blessing to others. He says, and having this confidence, I know that I shall abide. I, I'm going to live. I'm going to make it through this test. He might have been locked up in prison. He might have been facing execution right then and there. They may have had him scheduled next day to go to the chopping block, but God done told him he was going to live. So he wasn't counting that, right? Because he knew God done told him he was going to continue. He's going to stay on this earth. I don't know about you, but God's always at work around you. You hear me? I don't know what you believe about that, but Apostle Paul came to the place where he, he believed fully that God was always at work around him. And it, no matter what they had scheduled for his morning, his, his next day, it don't matter what was on their calendar. And Paul knew that God's got his own calendar, amen. God's got his own plan for his life. And whatever God says is going to trump over whatever anybody else says is going to happen. You Doctors might have told you, listen to me, doctors might have told you you're not going to make it. But God. I was listening to Brother John Krulish's sermon he preached last Sunday at the church that he was visiting at. He brought me a copy of it. What a good job he did. And he gave his testimony. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but Brother John was diagnosed to only have about six months to a year. It was four years ago. Oh, thank God. Bless the Lord. Stage four. That's, I heard him say that and I went like, oh my. And you may know somebody. You may know somebody personally in your family or you heard testimony of how that they were just, uh, somebody else had a plan for them. But God changed everything. Because God's always at work. And Paul was desiring to go home. He wanted to die. He wanted to go be with Jesus. But Jesus had a different plan for him. He said, son, that'll eventually happen, but not today. I got something else I want you to do. So Paul said, if I'm going to live then, my life is going to be to do what he's called me to do. And I thought about what my life should be like, especially in my twilight years. What should my life be like? What should it mean to others once I'm gone? What will they say? Will my life have any bearing? Will there be any substance to my life? Or did he just live and die? Will others say I'm so glad he was here for the time he was here because what he did touched my life. What he preached about meant something to me. I might not have never come to know Christ if he hadn't have told me about his great love for me. I want to be... A witness. Amen. I want to be a vessel that's used by God. So Paul says, uh, for me to live is Christ. And I, I was thinking about, I bet you might not have thought about this question, but it's never too early for you to start considering about your life and what it shall be when it's all said and done. And you've gone on. We'll meet together and we'll talk about those that have passed on. And it's funny to me, once folks have passed on, they, they, they all become saints. Yeah, every one of them. Every one of them. Like they, could, they could be, <laughs> exactly right, Brother Frank. They could be the meanest rascal you ever know. And you come to their service and all of a sudden we, they talk about how wonderful you was. <laughs> Two weeks before that, y'all wasn't even talking. <laughs> 
a week after you died and all of a sudden you, you loved them like your husband or your friend, your best friend. Better than your, better than your husband. <laughs> Amazing. So, but so it, it's not too early to ever start thinking about what you want for your life after everything is said and done. Now, all the things that, that people will say about you on this earth is going to, it's going to wane. It's going to, be, it's going to vanish away. It's going to be wishy-washy based on, on their experience with you. But, uh, but Paul says, this is what I, I, I want to know, let you know in verse 24, that to abide in the flesh or stay here on this earth is more needful for you. And having this confidence in verse 25, that he's saying that I know this is what's going to happen because God told me I'm confident I'm going to live. I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and the joy of faith. I told you earlier that the reason that Paul was going to live was for encouragement and for it to be a blessing. And right here he says, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance. Your furtherance means so that you can learn more about how to live like a Christian. You can learn more about Jesus. You can, learn, you can know more about what your Christian faith should be about. And for the joy of your faith to be encouraged. So I'm going to hurry up and try to get done because I know I have beat around this bush. Verse 26, that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Let me just wrap it up as quick as I can. Listen, our life should be and is to be filled with Jesus. And listen, we, and that should be what's in it. And we should be surrounded by those who will be encouraged and blessed by this fellowship. What I'm saying to you is, Paul said, God's leaving me here so that I can be an encouragement to you and a blessing. And what that made me wonder was this, how many people are going to be encouraged and blessed by my life? Let me ask you a question. How many people do you encourage and bless? I know some folks, when you see them coming, you want to go to the other aisle, you know. Because you're afraid you're not going to get encouragement and blessing. All you're going to get is, and your heart just sinks every single time because it seems like they, who is it? Was it Linus that had the little cloud? That, was that him? Pigpen. Everywhere he went. Uh, I, or, or, or Eeyore. Eeyore. <laughs> Eeyore, cool. <laughs> and the, the issue of being a blessing and an encouragement. And God began to deal with my heart. I wonder how many folks kill the lights and lock the door and turn off the TV when they see the preacher drive up. <laughs> I just wondered. I, I just wondered about that. And so I want to be a blessing. I don't want to be a burden. I want to be a blessing. I want to be an encouragement to folks. I want them to say, hey, I need to be lifted up. I need to give the pastor a call. Not call the pastor up and hear him bless me out. What are you doing calling me at this time of night? It's 830. I should be in bed already. <laughs> My printer don't work, right, Sandy? <laughs> <laughs> what a blessing. Our lives are to be filled with Jesus and surrounded by those who will be encouraged and blessed by this fellowship. And so I wrote down five ways, and this is my closing, five ways that I want my life to count. Five ways. I want it to count by my fellowship in the church. I believe that in this church is where I can help to encourage and to be a blessing. Amen. And so I want to be here every single time. Secondly, at church gatherings, not just church services, but I mean, if we, if we have a, if we build a fire out in the parking lot and roast a hot dog, that we're going to split six ways. I want to be there. I want to be there, not just to get the hot dog. I know what you're thinking. I'm, I want to be there so that I can be an encouragement and a blessing. And we, we do a lot of those fellowship gatherings, don't we? 
And I know some people say, man, every time we get together, we got to eat. I don't see a thing wrong with that myself. Amen. I ain't got a problem. Man, when you sit down at the table across from somebody and you can pick up a greasy chicken leg and it runs down both sides. And listen, I'm telling you, you're going to have to get in the fellowship with that person. Amen. You say, can I bore out now? Come around there. <laughs> you, you get in fellowship. And there's encouragement and there's blessings. I see folks that forego the food so that they can pray with one another. Amen. So I wrote down uh, in the church services, in the church gatherings, I wrote down that another way is Christian friends and family. If you want to you be a blessing and, and an encouragement, you, you need to have some Christian friends and family. If you want to receive encouragement and blessing, you need to make sure that your friendship is in the family of God. Christian friends and family. I know you're going to have some friends that are outside of the, of the body of Christ. I'm not, I'm not an idiot. I know that you work in the world. There's going to be people in the world that you're going to consider friends. That ain't an issue. Your main friendship, your main fellowship should be found with people that are of the same like faith that you are. Christians. Brothers and sisters in Christ and find your fellowship amongst them, friends and family. Uh, the next thing I, 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 I thought about was my own personal time of devotion and worship. That's important. If I'm going to be an encouragement, if I'm going to be a blessing, I better be spending time with him. I mean, my personal, I'm not talking about just coming on Sunday. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about just me and God, you know what I mean? Over a cup of coffee in the morning or maybe over the ride to work in the morning or maybe, uh, you know, whatever, uh, over uh, uh, the last cup of coffee at night, whatever it is, I, I need to be spending some personal time with God. Amen. There needs to be some personal fellowship with the Lord and, and, and studying His Word. And then lastly, um, I, and, and I, don't, I, I left this to last on purpose. I believe one of the best places, and, and this comes from my personal experience. I've been in church since I was three days old, wasn't I, Mama? Remember when I was here? You remember bring, me, me and you coming? I was three days old. I don't remember it, but she told me I was. And, and this comes from my personal experience, but it also comes from Scripture. Listen for a second. I have discovered that I have done more growing through my doing than I've, than I've done through any other way. It's good to come and to listen and to receive and then to go out. But listen, you need to find somewhere that you can plug in and you can get involved in ministry. My last point was working for the Lord, serving Christ. Now, in serving Christ, most people, most church members have it in their mind that the church is trying to get them to commit something so they can get free labor like slavery. That's not what it's about. I'm looking for you to understand that the Bible says this is not an organization, this is an organism. And when you're fitly joined together with the other parts of the body, all oh, the Bible tells us that every part thereof will benefit Amen. from the contribution of every part given their all. So when every part, you know how that is with your body. When everything's feeling good, everything's feeling good. Amen. When one thing hurts, that's, that's exactly right. So you, I'm just saying, so whenever you connect, when you plug in and you are getting that, that resource of serving in whatever capacity it is, you will not only become an encouragement, but you'll be a blessing. And you will receive encouragement and you'll receive a blessing, Brother Rick. And so my, my final point of that is there's five things I just told you about. Let me go over them once again because they, they'll walk slow. Here it goes right here. <laughs> Blessed by encouragement and by fellowship. A little faster than that. <laughs> church services, number one. Church gatherings, number two. Christian friends and family. You need to watch the circle of who you hang with. Somebody needs to amen that right there. Because I know some folks have been hanging around a, a bunch of devils. Christian friends and family in the church have personal devotions and study. And last but not least, serving or working for the Lord. Those things are vital. 
And Paul, Paul said, look, if I'm going to stay here, my life is going to be impactful for you. God's told me I'm to stay. Why? Did God not want him in heaven? Was he not allowed to receive the reward? Hadn't he already done enough? God said, son, there's some work to do. There's some still, I have some work left for you to do. So Paul gladly received, even though he admitted my desire is to be with the Lord, he gladly took the commission and said, if I'm going to live, buddy, I'm going to live it to the best I can for Christ. He said, and you guys are going to be blessed and encouraged because I'm going to come to you and I'm going to be Christ in your midst. I'm going to represent Jesus. And this is what I wanted to talk to you about today. Two things. If you've never known him as personal Savior, if you've never made that intimate personal decision to receive the sacrifice that was made for your sins, then today you're, today, you're, you're in luck. Today's your lucky day. He is waiting on you. Amen. He'll receive you with open arms today. Yes, and you can come into the beginning of that growth. Number two, you may have been born again, and you may feel like, as we talked about this morning before Sunday school, you may feel like you're going through a dry, spiritual desert place. You may feel like, man, my life just isn't meaning anything. It doesn't seem to be accomplishing nothing. I don't think I'm affecting anybody in my life positively for anything. I, I wonder why, why God don't just go ahead and take me home. I'm just kind of floundering around here. Because you need to recognize there needs to be a commitment, like Paul said, to live. And if you're going to live, it's going to be Christ living through you. Amen. To live a life that emulates Jesus Christ so that everyone around you will be encouraged and blessed. And then you too, because of that, because Jake, when I see you get encouraged, brother, it, it encourages me. If, I, if somebody comes to me and says, Pastor, what you said really lifted me up. You know what happens inside of me? There's something going, woo, woo. man, there's a little, little man jumping up and down in there. And I get all excited about that. Somebody, somebody says, what you did bless me. I go, oh, man, I'm so glad you told me that. That's why we like testimonies. So you may be here today and you know him, but you just don't feel like that you're connected good. Today's your day. We're waiting on you. Would you stand? Brother Rick. Oh.